Good afternoon and greetings from the beautiful MD Anderson Hall uh, on the campus of Rice University here in Houston, Texas. My name is Igor Marjanovic and on behalf of the faculty, students and staff of Rice Architecture, it is my great honor to welcome you to our second lecture of our annual lecture series titled Building Identities. Today, we welcome an esteemed architect, educator and mentor to many, myself included, Michael Willis. He'll be, he will be talking about a timely subject, building identities through my practice, the personality of architecture. I'm also delighted to introduce our panel today who will help me moderate this event. Those are our amazing Rice Architecture students, Isabel Numi Kwaku and Dante Gil Rivas, both of whom are members of our National Organization of Minority Architecture Students, or NOMAS. We are thrilled to have a NOMAS chapter here at Rice, and I'm particularly grateful to Anzila Gilmore and Christina Kennedy for their work and mentorship of our students that are engaged with this important organization and cause. I'm also grateful to Damian Hines, a Houston-based architect, uh, very involved with the local NOMA chapter here in the city. He has a thriving practice here, not far away from our campus, and he is, he is here today with us to introduce Michael Willis to all of you. And I'm delighted to hand over the Zoom podium to him. Thanks, Damian. Good afternoon, everyone. And Igor, again, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to thank the university for one, organizing this event. And I would also like to extend a warm welcome to new Dean, School of Architecture, Igor Marjanovic. Uh, welcome, Dean. Uh, as Dean noted, my name is Damian Hines, AIA NOMA, founder and principal of Hines Architecture and Design. I'm also a board member of Rice Design Alliance and several community focused nonprofit organizations in Houston. One organization in particular I'd like to acknowledge is the Houston chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects. As the immediate past president during the last few years of amplified social justice, it is important for so many of us professionals and students who identify with the organization's values to know that our mission through strong organization is to minimize the effect of racism in our profession. I encourage um, everyone to get involved with your professional NOMA chapters and your student chapters. Um, uh, students in NOMAs, um, please connect with your professional chapters. This is how we work and this is how we grow and this is how we stay connected. Um, reflecting back as a first year architecture student at Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Design, um, that's when I discovered the importance of uh, NOMA and NOMAS. And I personally discovered, as I told Igor, that that was the first time I felt connected to a larger community. So that is the importance of NOMA and that's the importance of NOMAS. Um, to our guest lecturer, Michael E. Willis, uh, FAIA NOMA, founded MWA Architects in 1988 and retired in 2016. Congratulations. He has been a design consultant for St. Louis, San Jose, San Francisco. He has taught at his alma mater, Washington University, um, uh, several degrees, uh, 73, BA, 76, MR, MSW, uh, 76. Uh, he's uh, taught at WashU in 2015, 2017, 2020, and currently the fall 21 semester. MWA's work includes housing in San Francisco, Oakland, Portland, post Katrina, New Orleans. Transportation projects include International Terminal at San Francisco Airport, Terminal 2 at Oakland International, and the Yoruba Bueno Moscone subway station in San Francisco. With infrastructure, Willis was the architect of major ozone nation, which is disinfection facilities, water reclamation, drinking water plants in LA and San Francisco, a biosolids treatment plant adjacent to an historic black neighborhood. He has been a panelist on many conferences from Harvard to Heidelberg. He's a distinguished Washington University alumni for the schools of architecture and social work. Michael will present the lecture, Building Identities Through My Practice, the Personality of Architecture, 
Please warmly welcome Michael. Thank you, Damien. And thank you, Igor, for the invitation. And thank you to you all for attending this talk. And I hope it's not just a talk, but a dialogue. So uh, this is a, when I got the invitation to, to think about this, I, I reread what the goal was for building identities. And I'm not gonna read it all to you, but here's just a, two, two small snippets. The construction of physical structures is inseparable from the construction of human identities. Building identities, in building identities, Rice Architecture seeks to broaden our understanding of building construction and identity formation as two interrelated processes, seeking to close the gap between the social and the formal in the field of architecture and our world more broadly. When I got this subject to reflect upon, my first thought was to remember two events, the 1930s Beaux Arts Ball in New York, where architect William Van Allen dressed up like his Chrysler building there in the middle. And the other was the Bauhaus costume balls, where the participants wore costumes uh, reflecting the art of the artists of, of the Bauhaus. Um, they reflect these costumes distorted the human figure and blended them with abstract shapes, movement, and light. I understand we're not talking about costume balls, but what the architecture we build says about identity, in this case, my identity. My abiding interest in architecture was to build buildings, to get the ideas out of my right brain and into the dirt as foundation and up into the air as structure. And then to have that structure speak to the people for whom we were building. Does this architecture work for you? Does it do what you intended? And more broadly, even after those questions were asked and answered, how does the architecture speak to the buildings on either side of it, to the block and to the city? So in that way, Buildings are speaking with a voice, reacting, being engaged, and moving with you like the Bauhaus dancers through time. So this is an experiment, so bear with me. I wanna change my focus from pure program to architecture, the brief on which we were, upon which we are generally hired uh, to perform a work of architecture, and move that toward, let's call it the character aspects of architecture. I picked out six buildings of mine that were formed by my own sense of identity, where I can remember how the experiences shaped the architecture. This is the Sobrante Ozonation Treatment Plant in El Sobrante, California. Our firm makes a very large contribution to water infrastructure. This was our first, the Sobrante Ozonation Treatment Plant. There are several aspects I can point to that would show, I'll, would show identity, but I'm going to pick one, the clear story. We design many approaches using circles and tangents but they all look kind of harsh to me uh, in terms of figuring out how we were going to bring light down into uh, the, the machine and chemical rooms. So the, mm, let's say the, the circles and tangents didn't work for me. So I just took a piece of tracing paper and drew the art shape by hand for the, for the jig that eventually formed the beams. So that shape that you see is bringing the light down into the building. So that gesture by a hand was saying what I wanted it to say, a gesture that captured the beams that brought in light and not just a manufactured device.
This is the Mandela Gateway Project in Oakland. This was formerly a 46 unit public housing project, which turned into a 182 unit mixed income, mixed, mixed income, mixed use housing. It has not only apartments for rent, but also 14 townhouses for sale in which the, um, in which the affordability is built into the deed, which means you can, people could not buy this as, a, as their own place to live for uh, whatever price and then flip it and sell it for six times, six times more. The, the affordability always stays with the housing. So what is it? This is a station that takes you to downtown San Francisco in seven and a half minutes. But what does it say? On the main arterial street, it says, I stand up to the arterial street. I face the movement of the rail line and I, ident I identify myself in context with the rail line. And one block over and one block behind, it drops down to residential scale to speak directly to the houses across from me. So it identifies as a transit destination and a walkable neighborhood street. And by the way, the 46 units of public housing still found a way to incorporate those former residents uh, into the new larger complex. And so no one was pushed out. This is the Yerba Buena Moscone subway station in San Francisco. This is a station on the new subway line in San Francisco, currently under construction. My identifier for this station was light. Light, light, and more light. I wanted the human experience of seeing, of seeing to be available to all from the street to the concourse. So you never go into a... Mm, a an enclosed elevator. Our way of making it happen was skylights and a glass elevator and glass elevator doors so that you would always be in the light, even while going down to the concourse level to buy your tickets. So you can see the glass of the, um, the vertical glass of the elevator doors. Uh, so you're always in the light. You can see to the left, the light coming down on the escalator. So you're always in the light. So this was um, critical to me to have light be the, uh, the feature of the project, seeing. So that experience, stepping into the elevator and experiencing the whole trip, all the while viewing art on all these walls, including uh, on that vertical surface above the metro sign is full of public art. So you're seeing the art, you're, you're feeling the light, you're seeing the light, you're feeling the art, even as you're coming down to the concourse. You're never in a dark box. This is the Halliday Plaza elevator in San Francisco. The idea for this elevator was simple enough. There was no direct way for the handicapped traveler to get from the street to the brick plaza at the next level and then down to the train course, concourse. The city was compelled to make it happen uh, by uh, a lawsuit from the uh, from accessibility access uh, activists. So the city was compelled to make it happen, but the response was a modestly budgeted elevator. Our response was to wrap that elevator in a perforated stainless steel skin, transparent enough to see through for safety 
and dense enough to hold a shape that cut the elevator, that made it an urban marker, uh, a wave, a gesture to the travelers who could identify the place by the visual reference. And you could take this train from that station to the airport, to the neighborhoods, no need for an address. The stainless steel wings act as the address. Next slide, please. Uh, and there is nothing cooler than having Italians write about your architecture. This was an article uh, in the architecture magazine Larca, and this the, the translation is a lift for the plaza. But what it really was, was to me, creating this neighborhood marker, this urban marker, and every now and then uh, the, that screen has been used for uh, video. So it's, uh, it's a very um, active part of the city, not just the mechanical part where you go in a box and you go down to the train, but it also speaks to the urban design of the plaza. Next slide, please. This is the Glide Cecil Williams Community House, also in San Francisco. This is a tall structure, just four feet short of a high rise, meant to house the formerly homeless and their children, provide classroom spaces for recovery and training, daycare, and a sign. The sign was another gesture, a hand reaching out to those who would come to be its beloved community. The original design sought to mimic the, the original design that we were um, uh, given sought to mimic the design of the historic church. We rejected that. Our thought was that by being a contemporary building, we would not diminish the historic character of the church, but we did want to show that outreach to the community and to the church in the architecture, not just in providing the housing, but by making a symbol at the top. The inspiration came from two places, a tribal African headrest and a wave that was described as Jan's hat for the late Janice Mirakatani, the co-founder of the Glide Foundation. So what we have is a hand reaching out over the steeple to call people to it. Next slide, please. Yes. And this may be the last time I tell the story, but as the CW house was opening, we were coordinating, uh, coordinating with volunteers who were giving tours of the building. A woman came in with her suitcase and asked, where do I check in? I said, ma'am, I'm going to be telling this story for the rest of my life, but your hotel is next door. This is for the poor people. Still a beautiful thing. This is Fulberg Lafitte in New Orleans. And yes, that is President Obama. In post-Katrina New Orleans, we were commissioned to reimagine entire blocks of the Lafitte public housing, one of uh, New Orleans' big four 1950s public housing blocks. Unsurprisingly, much of the massive blocks were disconnected from the city grid. And via a workshop led by UDA Pittsburgh, the community decided to rebuild it, even though they were originally skeptical that the new development would push them out. That didn't happen. We sought to reimagine the place, not as a new public housing project, but a 417 house mixed income community with the original public housing community still intact. The part you cannot see is the replacement of the entire underground infrastructure new water, new sewer laterals, replacing the 300-year-old pipes 
and a building area raised to three feet above the raised to three feet above grade uh, based on the flood maps, but three feet is what the neighborhood had anyway as porches. So the, the results were many. The neighborhood looked like the Treme neighborhood which surrounded it. Single story so-called shotguns, camelbacks up to two stories and multifamily buildings at the corners, new streets which blended in with the mature trees that we saved and color, color, color. What we were intent on doing was to bring back the spirit of the place, a place in which people wanted to live and not just had to live because of income or color or both, but because it is an amazing place to live. This is 10 years after the um, Hurricane Katrina and, and the president came down with the mayor to walk the streets, meet people, uh, just reach out, not just in words, but physically to people who live there and show them that that was their place. It's five, five blocks from a new uh, Veterans Administration and City Hospital, $2 billion of investment and workplaces and six blocks from the French Quarter. This is a remarkable place to live and walkable to transportation and work. I always like this picture because uh, if you look at the, 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 the look on the kids' faces, they cannot believe that the president is sitting there with sleeves rolled up, uh, drinking iced tea with everybody else. But this is what this project was meant to do. This was the gesture. This was not just here's housing for you and it doesn't matter how terrible it looks. You can't afford anything else. It's public housing. This is public housing. And it looks as welcoming as anything in that Treme neighborhood. Next slide. And we reconnected the streets. So it wasn't just blocks of brick barracks <laughs> um, surrounded by nothing, uh, but a, a street grid that became so inviting that the New Orleans parades once again came down the street, which they had stopped visiting that neighborhood for years. So the identity being rebuilt here was the spirit of the beloved community, one without stain or scars, with no outside indication or judgment of who lives there, but a place that honors every house and every family in the, at Faubourg Lafitte. And yes, they kept the name. They had the option of changing it to something um, more generic, but they were proud of the Lafitte name. So they kept the Lafitte name um, even when we reimagined its look and feel. So how do we build identity? This talk brings to mind the role that identity plays in creating architecture. So now I can bring, I can tie projects into my personal identity, but that wasn't the goal at the time. It was to get buildings built. But here and here I would make the distinction between identity and ego. Uh, next slide, please. It's not Howard Rourke uh, standing on the top of his building in the Fountainhead film or dressing up like your favorite building, uh, William Van Allen on the right. It's different than that. It's creating a gesture, a mood, a vision, and a tactility, the skin of the buildings that play a role in creating actual conver conversant architecture, architecture that communicates with not just the people inside it, but the city around it. I hope I've shown that to you. And I will close, I will leave you with an image that I made for an AIA celebration years ago. Next slide, please. 
this is this is a, an etching from uh, William Blake of uh, this character called Your Reason, Your Reason, coming down uh, from the uh, the upper upper cosmos down to Earth, and I took that image and made my own. The next one, please. This is my, this, the, the, the translation is, the, the quote is, so long of it's Eichnen sind wir Architekten. And the translation uh, is as long as we draw, we are architects. So it's not just this um, mechanical placing of boxes, but the idea of being a part of um, the spirit of the place that exists after we build the buildings, but it starts when we draw. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for your, for your talk and uh, amazing remarks. And thank you for allowing the time for us to have a real conversation and response to the issues you brought to the table. We really appreciate that. Um, I must say also, I really appreciate the kind of a equal dedication that you're showing your work to, as you say, building buildings, to the artifact of architecture, the drawing of architecture, uh, and what the buildings do for people uh, as they become inhabited. I think your work is one of the uh, exemplars out there uh, that architects don't have to make a choice between the two, that the social and the conceptual projects of architecture are not separate, but indeed uh, they're embedded in how we think about buildings. And uh, the important part of that thinking is the actual artifact of the building itself, what it looks like, how it's built, how it's constructed, and also how it works um, relative to the urban space uh, around it. Speaking of urban space around it, allow me to maybe just ask one question before uh, we open it to the panel. And in the meantime, I also want to in, uh, invite our audience to please feel free to drop any questions they might have in the Q&A section of the Zoom. So feel free to type in any questions and um, Dante and Isabel will help us moderate those questions. But um, speaking of urban uh, connection and uh, connection between a project of a building and a project of the city, maybe tell us a little bit about how your, for example, growing up in St. Louis and becoming an architect in St. Louis has influenced your practice as an architect. You've spent most of your career in a very different part of the country and the world, in the Bay Area, working on a range of projects from housing to civic buildings, infrastructural projects. But what did growing up in St. Louis meant to you and how did you bring that into your practice, consciously or subconsciously? Hmm. Well, I, I while I'm here, uh, visiting family, uh, because teaching or not, I, um, my family's still here, so I come to St. Louis a couple of times a year anyway. And I always drive through my old neighborhoods. And some are no longer there. Um, some which were traditional Black neighborhoods uh, back when, back when I was born, segregation was legal. So all this black community had to live in uh, prescribed places, but those places also held architects, judges, lawyers, and you know people who poured concrete for a living. It, it was a mixed income reality. So I learned a lot from living in the, uh, uh, around those people who went on to form their own businesses to you know to not let the the situation, the political and social situation keep them from rising. So uh, yes, it did, have a, it did have an effect on me because I, I looked at the neighborhoods that I, I grew up in and then my, the last neighborhoods I lived in before I came to California in 82 to open the office for one of those black architects, the San Francisco office, but it, it's, if I, I always hear the question, well, what is it that those people, you know, those, those people, what, what is it that those people want? And my answer was they, they want the same things that you want, 
transportation, walk to schools, shops, stores. Um, so growing up in St. Louis, um, uh, when I moved to California, when, yes, I saw the advantages of some of those neighborhoods that, and I brought with me the experience of, of um, what it would be like to transform those neighborhoods. So it's, um, I, I, I see lots of opportunities for change in St. Louis and status quo is just not, not possible. So it, 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 I, I met a, wonder, a wonderful group of people here that showed me that I could um, achieve without being pushed down by the society, but I also see the disparity in uh, the neighborhoods where people want to live and the neighborhoods where they were forced to live after segregation. Dante? Yes, hello, Michael. Thank you again for the lecture series. It was very uh, at least as a person of color that can relate as eye-opening to, to hear uh, another person of color uh, in such a successful level just talk about projects. But prior to the lecture series, when I first saw the title of it, um, Building Identities to My Practice, I read it more as uh, than just the literal facade or the form of the building or material selection, but rather designing architecture to represent the identities of people and knowing the scope of what this lecture was going to be or roughly. Um, my question for you is, uh, in the United States, there are many identities to represent. So how do you go about representing the diverse population we have in the United States? Or is it not about trying to represent everyone but those you identify with? Well, you know, um, it's, um, it is, it is, it is a, an interesting question because if you look at the, um, the history of the United States, uh, people came, they inhabited neighborhoods and they left to inhabit other neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods in St. Louis weren't just built for the Germans and the Irish or in San Francisco, the now very heavily Latino mission district, it was Irish. The thing that makes it now the mission district for Latinos is how they deal with public art, how they take those spaces adaptively reused and change them into the, into the spaces and services that mean something to that community. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, this is, it's a complex question because it's not saying I am, um, uh, putting a sign on this building that says it is now for the black population. What it does do is say, uh, I'll just use Lafitte as a, an example. Uh, we're making it possible for the black community to live here and have access to all those things that anybody else in New Orleans wants access to. So it, it stops, it stops, um, uh, putting uh, mm, barriers around that population, but in those in those um, adaptive reuse spaces, you can turn those into one of those uh, shops that we provided in the Oakland, the the retail level, has turned into a community food bank. Uh, um, you know, a, a one that uh, that espouses African. Uh, history, but if you squint at it, it's a storefront. It's what the people in that community did with that storefront. So it's a, uh, it's cities evolve, cities evolve, and the the way I've seen them evolve is people take that those spaces and make them relevant to their own communities. Thank you for the response. I'm here writing down what you say, so I don't forget about it. <laughs> Hi, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, so to kind of go off of that, I want to know how you think that these different identities kind of 
help us understand history because there is like a, a sense of adaptability with all these different buildings and whatnot. But how do you think that, yeah, how do you think that these identities in the architecture help us understand history? Well, um, I, I think, I think the, how architecture can help is by providing these pathways for your own creative thought, your own way of uh, living your best self. Um, and sometimes that is through Isabel, uh, unscripted space. You know, not just the community center, which, you know, that's where you're gonna go for big meetings, but for how the space opens up for you to be um, a, a, a thinking sensitive human being. I'll give you an example. Uh, I went to a talk um, in 2016, it was put on by Harvard and Washington University, but what they were talking about was uh, what happens after Pruitt Igo, that the, the, the famous housing project that was blown up in 1972 uh, and became a, a byword for the worst public housing in America. And I just have to say that I, I was, my family and I were the first residents of our apartment in 1956, shiny new, um, but by 1961, even Time Magazine knew that the project had failed. So what do you, how do you, how do you, and so at that lecture, one of the speakers was the, uh, a Missouri state senator, and she talked about her constituents living in an area that looked like Berlin after the war, fallen down buildings, stepping over bricks, but not reacting to it. And what she, 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 she likened it to a kind of a PTSD where the people living in those communities think well, that's must, that must be what they deserve. So uh, conditions that no other community would tolerate was the norm. And what I'm talking about identity, I'm talking about your identity. If you can walk out of your house, turn right, uh, step on a tram and get to the library, or you can walk out of your door, turn left and go to an open space and open that book and read it to, to let your ideas vote. That's the kind of neighborhood that we design for everybody anyway. So it's not just you know <laughs> for uh, people who used to live in public housing, it's what we would design for anyone. So I think the balance that we tried to make was to, was to not limit not, not to design down, but to design in the way that we would design for any, any constituent. And yes, it, is, it does have, I think, a very positive effect on designing for uh, minorities because they're, not, they're, they're, they're allowed to live in the same places that anyone would want to live. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, we have one question in the uh, question and answer. And this says, the burden of protecting a neighborhood from gentrification often falls on group efforts within the very community that is being gentrified. How can we as architects help combat those efforts besides through our own design? Example given, what powers do we have to help stop the efforts of larger developers? Um. Very good. Um, I think for our community, for, for, the, for the work that we do, which is largely public, 
uh, we worked for developers, very large developers, but were nonprofit who understood how to go into communities and talk with the people in those communities about what would be a good outcome for them. And that may be in any of these cities that I'm talking about. I'll give you one example in Portland, where we, we also have an office in Portland. We designed um, a, a new public housing community. And uh, unlike many cities that I've been to, Portland, because it was a working class city, still had uh, a large number of whites still living in the same places next to their black neighbors because it was economic. They were, it was, it was an economic level. But they, they, <laughs> they embraced each other so much that while we took down their terrible old public housing isolated moats uh, and built connected neighborhoods again, they all stayed together. They still had lunches. They still had, they, they, they made it their business to stay together. So when the new housing developments opened, they all came and said, we all want to live here. So how, how do you do it? How do you do it with um, large developers? I think this is something that the city cities uh, do and must have a role in. For instance, if they uh, make it as one of the conditions for developing large areas that it be a mixed income development, that is, not just people at 40% of the area median income get to live in one terrible place, but a kind of a neighborhood where like, uh, like Lafitte, like, uh, Oak, like Mandela Gateway, you can't tell the economic status of who lives there. We, it's all designed to the same level. The only difference is what you paid for it. So that came through the developers working through the city, uh, state housing. I know, I know there's, there's one just about in every state, uh, housing development corp. There's um, the financing vehicles like tax increment financing. Like, there, there are a lot of vehicles and, and these projects typically take 10 or so, uh, partners to finance it, no one, no one company or no one agency could write the check. Uh, after New Orleans, which lost 80% of its population in uh, after Katrina, HUD could, HUD, well, even HUD was decimated and HUD could not possibly have written the check for that, that project. So what made it work is that it became a neighborhood for a range of incomes. And that's a, I'm not, this is not a magic wand. This is a, still a tough conversation that cities have to have about how they want to see their neighborhoods develop. Uh, Houston's fourth ward, you know, this, this, this was uh, an intact black neighborhood. It's being, it's surrounded. There's uh, Enron right in the, the Enron building, right in line across the freeway. Uh, the interstate, which actually used to be on Friedman's land. I mean, it, 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 so it, it's a, when I, when I say tactile conversations, I mean, sometimes these are not comfortable conversations. And that the architects, you know, um, I've, I've heard this from our, our own folks, you know, they said, well, you know, what, what about us? What, when do we get a chance? I said, no, you, you, you'll, get your, you, you'll get a vote, but only after you listen to everybody that lives around you. Then you can say, aha, I heard what you're saying about what you want in your neighborhood. And here are some examples of responding to you. So I, I, I think it's, it's, <sighs> We, we had a lot of magic wand solutions. Um, 
Uh, Pruitt Igo was one. There's a great photograph of all these wonderful uh, bow tied architects pointing at the the Pruitt Igo model and you know, based on, of course, Le Corbusier and this, the, new, the brave new world of building cities. And, uh, but how did, that, how did that actually work out for Pruitt Igo? Not so well. Uh, the film on that is the Pruitt Igo myth. If you haven't seen it, I would suggest a stiff cup of cocoa to watch it. It's a little, it's a little tough, but it does, it does, start from those shiny days to the very end. And, and so as an architect, I went around whatever parts of the world I was in to look at those architectural models that were built from the same thesis. Um, 1927, the Weissenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart. Uh, who were the architects? Uh, Van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, Oud. I mean, all of the, the modernist names were there and the Siedlung is still there. I went there and people were still putting their babies in strollers and walking out of their apartments. And what was the difference? Um, you can walk to the transit station. You can walk to a park. It's connected to the rest of the city. It's not this wonderful, terrible isolated moat where you get to live because you don't have a choice. So the, yeah, I think there is, um, I think listening to all those stories about what makes neighborhoods work and what made the parts fail that failed. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you another story about New Orleans. The, 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 the Lafitte project, even before Katrina, was failing. It was less than half full. Those brick boxes on those isolated streets, you know, one or two streets went through, but it was, you know, but it was, Katrina had nothing to do with making it fail. It was failing as housing. And in those first community meetings, people said to the developers, uh, to the city, we would rather live in this failed brick box than to have you push us out, build this shiny new place and push us out. We would rather live here. It was pretty tough. And it was only after the commitment to make this the community's project as well, did the, I will call her the community mother, um, Mrs. Amelda Paul, when Mrs. Paul got to the very last workshop and said, you know, I think we can do this. The project took off and she still lives there. She lived there, she lived there, you know, for 30 or 40 years, but she still lives there now. So the point was you, <sighs> you will get your chance to design, but you have to open both your ears first and you will get you'll 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 get a chance to to design that's that these i i, I stopped looking at these as technical problems a long time ago it's not that we don't know how to design of course we do but how do you design for that community in that location with this population that is that's the thing to work on We also have another question from the uh, chat. Um, so this one's from Nathan Dreamy. says, thank you for the lecture. How have you managed to speak to and accommodate the basic needs of a marginalized population while dealing with the limitations and restrictions that often accompany designing for them? For example, have there been specific obstacles that you can speak to relating to budget, zoning, outside perceptions, et cetera, that had to be overcome while designing your mixed income housing project? What was the process? Um, the short answer is yes. <clears throat> there, there, are, there are all of these problems that have to be overcome. And, um, and as I said before, there are, there are multiple aspects and how to look at it. One is 
and this might be this might be the, the hallmark of most of the projects that we're talking about from, from, from our firm anyway, is that they are not one income because then the brain or the developer brain starts saying, well, they can only afford you know, $300 a month. So we're gonna design whatever fits in that $300 a month box. Our approach and our nonprofit developer approach was to say, no, we're gonna design for a mixed income, which means amenities, which means features, which means all of those things. And the difference is we're gonna to have to work extra hard to find out how to get this forces, the sources together to pay for it. So it's not, it, it's, 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 it's kind of pulling apart the, the 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 kind of um, what do you what do you say the um, uh, the simple calculation of of dollars per square foot per square foot times the rent you can pay and say what should we have in our community how can we connect this how can this be uh, a community that anyone would want to live in because one of the things that I'm sorry to say that when you design, with, 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 if, if you don't get out of that mindset, um, is that you can identify the community by just driving by and, and looking at their houses. Do you know who lives there? Uh, uh, a long, long time ago, maybe when I was eight or so, I was 59, yeah. Uh, my, my, my family decided that we had to get out of Pruitt Island. It was, in 59, it was failing for us as a family. So my father, who is a square, went to uh, public health, went to real estate agents and said, and he had a job, he had two jobs. He had, you know, wasn't, he, he, he was filling out the paperwork and the real estate people said, well, where do you live now? He said, oh, where'd I go? They said, oh, I'm so sorry. If you'd only come yesterday, we would have had a perfect place for you. This happened about five times because he just answered the question. Well, where, where do you live now? Oh, oh, where'd I go? And they shut him out until the light came on and he realized the thing that was keeping him from finding a place for his wife and six children was Pruitt Iga. So he went to my grandmother and begged her, his mother, my grandmother, and begged her to let him say that we lived with her in Richmond Heights out in the county. And my grandmother hated liars. She did not like it, but finally she said, okay. And the next time he went to the real estate agent, oh, where do you live now? Oh, Richmond Heights. Okay, here's an apartment for all eight of you to sign here. So the, that lesson, I mean, it's a long, long time ago, but that lesson stayed with me because people have started to identify you by where you live whether that's Pruitt Igo, Chicago, Cabrini Green and Chicago, I mean Cabrini Green in Chicago, Pruitt Igo in St. Louis, or the so-called big four um, public housing projects in New Orleans before Katrina stepped in. So it's 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 it, it makes it a bit more uh, interesting, doesn't it, uh, socially, because you can't say, oh, I come from the blankety blank neighborhood, and then you can identify, assess, put labels on everything about that person just from finding out where they live. If you said, now I live in Treme, oh, Treme, yeah, the quarter's over here, the bands, the, the, the parades come through the street, hospitals over there, it's, it's Treme, it's not, the Treme housing projects. I mean, it's 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 one of the things that uh, all of you are going to have to deal with is that when you're designing, 
for particular populations, you have to take into account where they live now and how other um, communities, agencies, city developers see that community. And so it, as architects, you should focus, my opinion, you should focus your attention on where is it that people want to live? Uh, a place that has, I just, I just picked another one of my favorite neighborhoods in, in the world. And I just listed the things that you could walk to in 15 minutes. Uh, shops, art supply, uh, bars with outside seating and blankets, major transportation hubs, farmers markets, a bakery, a very small market, 10 to 15,000, not 60,000, 70,000 with an acre of parking in front of it. These are tucked into the mixed use projects. Uh, secondhand clothing, bike lanes, kindergartens, uh, adaptive reuse, and bookstores. Who, who wouldn't want that? So my, my, my benediction, I suppose, is that when you think about design, especially designing in communities, think about those um, places. If you, can, if you can identify and say, this is a place that anybody would want to live, you're on the right track. And, uh, and to keep into mind that, that, that idea of scripted and unscripted space, you know, places where you have this, um, open possibility for just walking out and taking your book and reading, as opposed to uh, every space has got to have a script. I, I don't think so. Hey, Michael, I'd like to ask a, a question. Um, when it comes to, uh, well, change is sometimes difficult, right? And, and met with uh, suspicion. When it comes to um, providing design equity in marginalized or at-risk communities, um, is it often well received? Is there, you know, with suspicion, uh, does sometimes equity means yes, I want these things. However, my neighborhood may change, and therefore I may not live in my neighborhood in 10, 15 years if it changes. Have you, relative to the, you know, your uh, public work, um, have you encountered like um, great resistance or suspicion from marginalized or at-risk communities when you attempt to work? Um, just about every time, uh, because we have, we, the society at large, have trained them to believe that every time they see somebody walking down the street in a suit, you're there to push them out. Even if it wasn't you, even if that was 30 years ago, even if they, they, they we have trained them to believe that um, progress means we go. Because now that space is cheap enough that outside developers are coming in to saying, well, we can buy up this for a dollar. Um, move all of you out rebuild this nice, wonderful place with a whole new population. Yes, of, of course, they're suspicious. Why, why, why wouldn't they be? And so our task is to involve those very marginal, those same marginalized people in the discussion about what works in their neighborhood. Why would, what, what, what would you want to see? What would work for you, not the rest of the city or not you know, the people itching to move in on top of your properties, but what would work for you? And you have to be, you as the architect have to be able to represent those things in the, in the design because the first, it seems like the first act is building trust because without that trust, uh, well, you can just take the bulldozer approach, you know, no trust, I bought it, it's mine, 
we're flattening everything year out and we're building new houses for uh, for a different population. Fortunately, um, the clients that I've worked with, uh, bridge housing in California, enterprise community housing, uh, well, they're everywhere, but they're based on, on the East Coast. They came out of the Rouse Corporation, uh, Covenant House in New Orleans, all of these they know how to develop at scale and they know how to get funding at scale so that it's not just a, um, a calculation that says, sorry, uh, we're, 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 we're buying up your property and moving you out. And that's why the city, that's why the city has to be involved. On, on private, purely private projects, which wasn't our experience, uh, we'd walk down the street and see the billboards up and there's a new project going up. I had no, we had, I didn't know. I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't. It, they weren't required to let me know what was happening. But in the city, uh, especially cities with a, a large marginalized population, the city has to be involved with how those neighborhoods rebuild, which is what my studio is about this year at WashU. It's 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 uh, building the things that you'd want there and then sorting out how that gets financed. Michael, thank you so much for those thoughtful remarks, for your presentation and for your passion for these very important issues in architecture, uh, both obviously where you worked uh, in the Bay Area, but also definitely relevant for us here in Houston. Uh, we thank you for participating. Um, we wish you best in the next phase of your professional and teaching career. Um, and we really look forward to welcoming you here in Houston face to face uh, before too long. Uh, your lecture has raised important questions. Uh, we have many more questions to ask and we hope we'll get a chance to do that in person uh, here uh, very soon. Uh, Damien, uh, Dante, Isabel, uh, thank you for helping us host Michael here at Rice Architecture. Uh, I'm grateful for your passion and for your service both to our school and to the National Organization uh, of Minority Architects, um, which is an important beacon of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in our discipline. In closing, let me thank all of you for attending our lecture and our event today. We look forward to seeing you again for the third installment of our lecture series this fall, which will be on Wednesday, October 13th, when we will gather to welcome Chilean architects Cecilia Puga and Paula Velasco. In the meantime, we wish you good health and all the best from all of us here at Rice Architecture. Thank you and goodbye.